Thank you that you have called us to be holy, to walk with you, to look to you, to live our lives according to your will and guidance. I ask today as we open the scriptures that we would learn from you, that we would grow, that we would walk with you better than we did when we got here. And we praise you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. What is the hardest thing you've ever had to do? According to Tom Petty, the, the waiting is the hardest part. Some other people think breaking up is hard to do. Some people even think that they've tried so hard and got so far and in the end it didn't matter. These are all song lyrics in case you didn't notice. <laughs> Some people just had a hard day's night. <laughs> What's the hardest thing to do for many of us? There's, there's a lot of things that are difficult, that are challenging. Sometimes we'll feel like a certain circumstance is difficult. For most of us, at least according to statistics, the hardest thing to do is to stand up in front of a crowd and talk. But there's all sorts of things that happen. You know, if you ask my wife right now what's the hardest thing that you have to do, she's going to say, oh, birth, it's not going to be fun. Sometimes it can be breaking up. I remember Joanna and I actually broke up when we were 16. And it was one of the most painful, horrible times of my life. I still look back on it with this awful uh, experience and this awful feeling of how it felt to have my heart ripped out bodily. I survived. It was all my fault, by the way. She'll, she'll tell you all the, the great story. But uh, I broke up with her a week before February or uh, Valentine's. But I had to. My parents made me. It's all their fault. <laughs> blame, blame it on someone else. That's a human way. Hard things can change over time. When you're young, you know, the hard thing can be waiting until Christmas. When you're old, you can be watching your children or your uh, grandchildren going through difficult times. There's always something that is a challenge that's difficult. But for many of us, actually, the hardest thing in life is something internal. It's surrendering control to God. Giving up our plans walking God's way, taking our hands off the steering wheel and saying, you truly are Lord. We want the walk of faith to be easy, to be simple. We want it to be something where it just kind of helps us, makes us better, makes us stronger. You know, it's like having an energy drink that just kind of gives you that little bit of pep in your step that's going to make you able to do all you wanted to do better and happier, more full of joy. We want it to be easy, but is that how the walk of faith is? Well, the good thing is we don't have to just do philosophy on this. We can open the scriptures and find out. So turn with me to Matthew 10, and we're going to begin in verse 34. Now remember, Jesus has been talking to the apostles as he sends them out. He's been warning them, persecution is going to come. Get used to it. Deal with it. It's part of being my disciples. If they hate the master, they're going to hate you. He said, don't fear, don't worry, because it is going to be okay, because even I, I care even for the sparrows, so how much more do I care for you? And now he comes and he says, don't think that I've come to bring peace to the earth. I thought he was supposed to be the Prince of Peace. Isn't that what they said? We bring tidings of great joy and peace, peace on earth for all mankind. And here's Jesus saying, don't think I came to bring peace to the earth. I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. For I've come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. I mean, that happens normally anyways, but this is for a different reason. <laughs> a person's enemies will be those in their own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Jesus has been talking about fear, talking about persecution, talking about the difficulties that you will uh, encounter walking with God. And then he says, by the way, guys, if you thought that you're going to have an easy life. If you thought that once you become a believer, everything is just going to smooth out and you're going to walk through this sweet, milk chocolatey goodness that is life with nary a problem or something to ruffle your hair, I've got another idea for you and I want you to hear it. I didn't come 
to bring peace to your life. I didn't come to make all the problems go away. That's not why I came to you. That's not why I saved you. That's not what it's all about. I actually came to bring the opposite. When I get involved in your life, things are going to change and some people aren't going to be okay with it. When I get involved in your life, people are going to hate you and you're not going to be able to do anything about it. When I get involved with your life, all that you used to know and understand and live is going to be turned on its head and it's going to go right down to the family level. It's not just going to stop at your blood, but when I get involved in your life, you're going to find that fathers turn against sons, children turn against parents. There will be strife because Jesus doesn't allow any second best or anything to get in the way of him. He says a person's enemies will be in their own household because there is nothing that can get in the way of a relationship between Christ and a person. And you will find that the closest relationships are the ones that will suffer the most as you walk with God. What's the key in this passage? He tells you, whoever loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Now let's think about this. What is the closest relationship that you have on earth? Especially as a kid. Who's it with? Mom and dad. Mom and dad, father and son, mother, daughter, these are the closest, the most intimate, the most personal relationships that you can have. They are the tightest bonds that bind. And they're designed to be that way. Family ties are important. The family is the basic building block of the universe. You know that? Despite what all certain ideological people would like to say, the family is the basis of society. If you don't have family, if the family is destroyed, it actually shatters the fabric of a country. And that Jesus is coming along and what is he saying? If this is your most important loyalty, your most important tie, then you're going to have problems. Because guess what? I've come to demand everything from you. I've come to take the place of anyone else in your life who would be higher, who would be greater, who would be more important. On any day, if the choice comes up and it's between your own blood and me, you have to go with me. I came to bring that to you. An entire reordering of the way human beings exist. That's kind of intense, isn't it? This is one of those Sundays where everything's going to be soft and feel good, by the way, in case you were wondering. <laughs> he says, if anyone loves their father and mother more than me, they're not worthy of me. This isn't a nihilistic rejection of family and friends, by the way. This isn't Jesus saying, I want you to go home and I want you to, you know, pack up your stuff and leave and never talk to your mom and dad again. Or, you know, throw your kids out of the house and say, well, it's about time you started flying on your own. Jesus isn't saying, I'm coming to destroy families, but rather that a side effect of total faithfulness to Christ and walking with Christ is that even your family will be separated by the decision of who they are loyal to. If your kids decide they don't want to walk with God, it creates a divide that can never be repaired, even if you love them to death. You're still not in the same world anymore. If your parents are not walking with God, it creates a divide that cannot be repaired. You can't just one day say, well, I guess you're more important. Walking with Jesus means that everybody takes a back seat. Even our most intimate relationship of marriage. If at the end of the day I love my wife more than I love my God, I've got a problem because I'm not truly loving my wife. What Jesus is saying here is that if you want to be the way a human was meant to be, then Jesus must always come first in your world. And this isn't a, an attack upon the family or a, a lack of care. This is the only way we truly can care for those who are closest to us. 
it's a little bit like when you see people who are saying, well, you know, I don't want to discipline my kid because I'd, I'd never want to not be friends with them or I'd never want to see a, a, a tear cross their eye that I caused. Their desire is that they should just always have warm, fluffy, happy feelings. But in the end, what happens to that kid? Have you ever met him? <laughs> Etc. I could do a good, uh, good impression because maybe, or maybe I had to be dusted a few times as I was growing up in order to keep on the path. We sometimes think we want what's best for people, but we actually do harm. And if we ever choose anything else or anyone else above Christ, we actually harm those people because we then live in sin and sorrow and all the ways of the world. And that doesn't just have an effect upon us but it has an effect upon everyone we care about. If we truly care for people, it means we have to be willing to surrender them to Christ, to give up our hold, our authority, our control over even those we love the most. I was sharing with Natasha the, the stories of a guy named Otto Koning. He was a missionary. And he would, went over to Papua New Guinea where there was no... Uh, medical care or anything readily available and one day their child got sick and they were trying everything they could to make the child better but they couldn't get him out to health care and nothing they seemed to do would help the fever just kept mounting the child was getting weaker and weaker and finally Otto Koning said okay Lord I don't have what it takes to care for this kid I'm giving him to you this is my most precious child but I'm not big enough I'm going to surrender to you. I'm going to value you more and trust that you can care for my kid more. And actually the kid recovered and everything was fine. But he learned that lesson that if we want to care for our family truly, we even have to give them to Christ and put Christ ahead of them in our lives. And this is why Jesus says, if you care for them more than me, you're not worthy of me. You don't want what I'm offering. You don't want to walk with me. This is just a good test for you. Hey, is anyone more important than me in your life? Okay, then you're not actually wanting to walk with me. Eat, drink, be merry, for tomorrow you die. If you aren't willing to give what it takes to care for, or to care for Christ above all else, then there's something still missing in you and in the way you walk with God. And this is why, this is a very important message for us today because this is where a lot of us trip up. You know, I've heard from people before where it's, oh, I love Jesus and I would walk with Jesus forever, but you know what, if, if my child died, then I'd be out. That's too much. He'd be asking too much. Some other people would say, you know, oh yeah, I'll walk, I'll walk with Jesus for sure, but you know what, if, if I'm not confident that, that my parents are going to go to heaven, if God wouldn't save my parents, then I'm out. If he doesn't love them that much, then I don't love him. I won't have anything to do with him. And on and on it goes. The number of people that I've heard where they say, the reason I don't walk with God is because so-and-so was sick and I prayed and they didn't recover and they died. So therefore, I don't believe in God. It's that same problem that someone has been allowed to get in the way of a walk with God. And more importantly, your idea of what's good for that person and your relationship with that person has gotten in the way of you doing the only thing that can really help and care for that person. I know someone else who their child has walked off from the faith. They claimed to be a Christian as they were growing up, but now they're living like the devil. And these people, though they know what's right, they want to keep the doors of communic communication open. They don't want to cause any ruffles. They, they want to still leave the bridges intact. And so they support and encourage the way that this person is living. And it's sinful and it's bad and it's hurting them every day. <coughs> but they go, gosh, golly gee, what else can we do? We can't just surrender them. And I'm saying, hey, you better, quick, before things go sideways. Each and every one of us has this deep temptation to abandon Christ for the sake of our family, our friends, the things that are the closest to us because we don't know if at the end of the day he is totally trustworthy with them. Yes, Lord, I'll give you everything else, 
but I'm going to hold on to my kids just in case. Yes, Lord, I'll give you everything else, but I couldn't do without my wife. I had to have this conversation with the Lord about, what was it? I was in seminary. I can't remember how long that was ago. It feels like forever. And Joanna had, it seems, a tumor growing in her head. And it was getting bigger. It was causing a lot of very serious problems, side effects. She was, you know, dealing with palsies. Or her face wasn't working right, all these different things. And the discussion was that this could be terminal, that this could be death. Now, I know that if I died, she would be just fine because she's very intelligent, and beautiful, and capable. But I also know that if she died, I would be an absolute wreck and probably die shortly thereafter. And I had to wrestle with God. God, if you take her, are you still good? If you choose that this is her time to go, do I really love you enough to trust that you know what's best? And let me tell you, it took some wrestling. <laughs> But I had to come to the point of saying, Lord, you are in control and you care about her more than I ever could. And I had to surrender her to him. My wife is not my own. She's Jesus's. I get this privilege of living life with her. But I don't have the control over her life. I cannot protect her. I can't make her take the next breath. I need to trust him with her. And no matter what he does in my family, I need to trust him enough that I stay walking with him and know that he only wants the best. The scriptures promise that God works all things together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. And there's no caveats, there's no accepts, there's no buts in that statement. God is trustworthy. So whoever loves anyone else more than him will find that they're not worthy of him. This defines every decision in our life. This is the total lordship of Christ. That nothing, no one can be more important than him. It's easy to say. And I'm talking about myself here. It's easy to say. You can stand up there and you can say, I surrender all. But at the end of the day, when Jesus comes knocking and says, what about this? We can start having the conversation where we say, well, maybe not that. And pretty soon we say, I surrender some. And then after a while we say, I surrender none. You can come along with me if you want to, Jesus, but it's going to be my way. And he says, depart from me, I never knew you. Nothing can be more important. And if that's not clear, he sharpens it even more. He says, whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. For whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. He wants to make sure that we understand this. So he says, here's the deal. A cross is an instrument of torture and pain. A cross is something that leads to death. There's nothing good or happy or joyful about the cross. And he says, if you're not ready, if a cross is handed to you to pick it up and to follow me, then you're not walking with me. If there's something in you that holds back, that pulls back, that says, no, that's a bridge too far, then there's still something that needs to be done in your heart. There can be nothing that can get in the way of walking with God wherever he takes you. Now let me tell you guys, this is not an easy conversation to have if you don't understand the goodness of God. This is not an easy conversation to have if you don't understand his faithfulness, his trustworthiness, the fact that he cares for you and loves you more than you could ever hope to love yourself. If you look at this God in heaven and you think of him as a judge as the big thumb, as the one who will destroy you and smite you, as the one who looks at you sideways and says, I hope you can be good enough, then this is a terrifying thought. What, I have to go wherever he leads me? But he wants to hurt me. You have to know the God you serve. God is good and faithful and loves you deeply and richly. 
God knows you intimately and he cares for you more than you could care for yourself. So if a cross shows up in your life, it's not because he wasn't paying attention or because he wants to hurt you, but it's because there is nothing that could be better for you than to carry that cross. We must know, love, and trust him. Are you willing to die in the worst possible, horrible, terrible way that can come if Jesus, who cares for you, calls you to it? Are you willing to give up the thing that you value most? You know, first he talks about your family and he says, hey, are you willing to give your family to me? And some of us, we can even get that far. Okay, I'll give you my family. But then he comes knocking on the door and goes even further. How about your life? How about your comfort? How about your safety? How about your future? How about your hopes, dreams, passions, ideas, everything you have? Are you willing to give it to me? You want to find your life? You're going to lose it. You want to try and hold on to everything yourself? You can't. You're only a human. You're incapable of controlling even your next breath. You're incapable of controlling what goes on around you in the world, what happens to you. You can't even make the sun rise or the wind blow. Trust me, if a farmer could make it rain, they would, right? I'm sure you've tried the odd rain ads just to see if it works. We have no control. We have to trust him. Because if we try to grasp onto our life, we will lose it every time. We're not powerful enough. Funny enough, there's a document down in the States, I'm not actually a really big fan of. It's an enlightenment thing. Come and talk to me and I'll tell you why. But one of the things that it says is that the Creator has endowed us with the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Did you know that's not true? Jesus has endowed you with the rights to death, slavery, and the pursuit of Christ. You don't have the right to life. Did you know that? You have whatever God gives you. Now, he gives you eternal life in his name, but you don't get to decide that you can pursue all that you want to, to hold on to this life, to get all that you can. He actually calls you to surrender that life to him. He doesn't say you get to have all the liberty you want, to do whatever you want, to go whichever way you choose, to be the captain of your own soul. He says you must be a slave to righteousness. You must be a servant of the Lord. You must call me master. You must let me make every single decision in your life to give you what's best in every circumstance because you're not trustworthy enough to look after yourself. You're like a little baby and the diaper's full and it's stinking. You need him. He doesn't say you can pursue happiness joy, comfort, ease, all the good things of life, but he says you can relentlessly pursue me. You can walk with me. You can take all that I have for you from this life. But the moment you try to pursue happiness, what happens? Has any of us ever tried? I know I have. It never succeeds, right? It's like trying to aim your car. You know, if you look at the, at the uh, fence post, you're going to hit it every time, right? Well, we think that it's that easy with our lives that if I just aim for the brass ring, maybe I'll manifest things, right? And it's all going to work out. And yet it doesn't. It all turns to dust in our hands. There's that good old song, right? Dust in the wind. All we are is dust in the wind. And boy, is that true. All that we build, all the great things that we have, everything we strive for, we turn around and all of a sudden it's gone and there's nothing left. We have no hope in ourselves. If we try to hold on to our life, the harder we hold on, the worse we go. It's a song lyric day. Have you heard that good 80s song, Hold On Loosely? <laughs> if you hold on loosely, then you can actually save your relationship. But if you cling too tightly, you're going to lose. And that's the way it is with your life. Now, Jesus isn't saying commit mass suicide or do some sort of weird Jim Jones thing. He's not saying go out and kill yourself for me. But what he's saying is this thing that you value the most, your life, 
Give entirely to me. Devote yourself and everything you do to me. Make every decision from putting on your socks in the morning right on through according to my guidance and what's best according to my economy. Now that means we will have a drastic life change. My idea of what was best for me was I was going to become a soldier. Well, that didn't work. Most people have an idea of what would be best for them. When I went into Bible school, I think I've told you the story, I said, there's two things I know about myself. I'm not a front of the church kind of person, and I'm not academic. Turns out I didn't know much about myself. And this is what happens to each of us. When we try to pursue our idea of what's best for us, we fail because we don't even know us. But when we open up the, the owner's manual from the guy who built us, and when we trust him and follow him, he takes us exactly where we were intended to go. This isn't a sentence of death where you walk around going, oh, I've got to follow Jesus and it's going to be terrible. But this is a sentence of joy and life where you actually get to be who you're supposed to be. You get to sit in the front of the service here, pastoring a church and listening to everyone singing and having such a good time with people. I never could have imagined this kind of a life, but Jesus gave it to me. It was just like, here, Matthew, have all the good stuff. I guess it's hard. <laughs> and this is what he does for us. It's not a sentence of doom. Trusting God, giving our life to him is the freedom of joy that we know the creator of the world and that he has made us and that he has given us a life and when we walk in it, we experience far more than we could ever have hoped or asked or imagined. It's great, but if we're not willing to do that, we're not worthy of the cross. We're not worthy to walk with Christ because we don't want to. Jesus isn't interested in half measures, and you can't plea bargain with him. Did you know that? Oh, Jesus, I'll tell you what. I'll give you this much of my life, but I'm going to keep this part just for a time. How about that? Is that a good deal? Jesus isn't so anxious to try to get souls for heaven that he's going to go around trying to do deals. You know, it's not like the song, The Devil Went Down to Georgia, right, where it's all about fiddling and who can get the soul. That's not the way it works. God is in charge. God is in control, and we Submit to the Lord. He calls us to devote everything to Him. Our life, purpose, finances, hopes, dreams, passions, preferences, all of it. Incidentally, this is where I come to my good Baptist alliteration. Cash, kids, and call. You want to ask where God is going to test you the most in whether you're walking with Him? It's in those three areas. What you do with your finances. Who, or, or, uh, whether you're going to have kids and how you're going to raise them and whether you're going to trust him to keep them alive. And then the call in your life. What are you going to do? What's your purpose? What's your existence? All those areas you will continually be challenged. Every day you will have to surrender because there's always that temptation as humans to just reach out and take control for a second. Oh God, you're doing it wrong. Let me adjust. And then you go off into the ditch and crash and there's flames and explosions. There's always that desire in us to take back some control. And anytime we feel that temptation, we have to go back to Christ and surrender to him. It's a daily walk of taking up the cross. So why would we do such thing? Why would we give up our lives? Well, he goes on and he says, whoever receives you, receives me. Whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. The one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. The one who receives a righteous person because he's a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. The one who gives even a cup of water to one of these little ones because he is my disciple. Truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. Did you know that heaven is not a communist dictatorship? It's not a collective where everyone gets everything evenly? There are rewards in heaven. Did you know that? Salvation's just the start. It actually talks about the fact that in our acts, as we walk with God, as we live by the Spirit, we build up either gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, and stubble that will be burnt up in the end. If we live by our own lights, by our own ways, we build up combustible materials. We build up this grand, 
beautiful work of art, but the only problem is it's made out of oil-soaked rags, and the next thing you know, whoosh, it's gone. Have you ever done that with, uh, with gunpowder? I love playing with gunpowder. You take FF or triple F powder and you put it in a, in a little can. I was doing it with the youth group a while ago. And you light it on fire and it just goes, and then it's gone. And there's a little bit of residue and that's it. That's all you get from it. It's no fun. Well, it's lots of fun. But <laughs> when you're looking at your life, if that's all you're getting from your work, you're slaving, you're striving, you're building for your own kingdom, why would you do it? It's vanity, a chasing after the wind. But if you're building for Christ, you are indeed building something that lasts, that has an eternal reward. God actually says you are going to get rewards. By the way, it says that he's going to be uh, building us a house in heaven, you know, a place to live. And I always say to people, I'm sure mine is going to have a nice big library with all the books I never got around to reading while I was on earth. I'm going to really enjoy it. God is giving us in this world freedom from sin, purpose in life, the blessing of being his hands, feet, and voice, and in eternity we have salvation and the rich rewards of the good works that God has done. There's a song, man, I'm really on songs today. There's a song called Thank You, uh, and it's the story of a guy who comes to heaven and he was just a nobody. He was no one important. And yet when they get to heaven, there's this lineup of people who are coming and saying, thank you for what you did on this earth. It was never noticed. No one ever saw. But because of you, my life was changed. Because of you, I came to know Jesus. Because of you, I was healed. I was made whole. And person after person is showing just how much you did. And that's the true reward we get. We get to be the ones who are blessed to be God's hands and feet and voice. We get to be the ones that have people's lives changed because God used us to speak. Because God used us to do something. Someone got to experience God because he chose to manifest himself in me today. And that is amazing. That is a gift from God. This reward is not transactional, but based on our heart. And that is the key thing that Jesus is trying to show you. It's not about your external or what you do, but it's why you do it. He says, if these things are done, that's one thing, but if they're done because it was for a disciple, because it was for one who, who is a Christian, it was done for the right reasons, then the reward is great. You can do activities for the wrong reasons, right? You can even preach the gospel for the wrong reasons, right? It always makes me think of Ka in the Jungle Book. Have you ever watched that, uh, the, the old Disney film or read the books? Here comes this snake to the human boy and he says, hey, trust in me, I'll help. And all the time while he's singing, he's trying to hypnotize him and get him to walk down his throat. We can do things for the wrong motive. We can help so we can build ourselves up or we can make ourselves feel better. All these reasons. But when Christ takes hold of us, then our heart is right and we do things the way God calls us to do and we get God's rewards. So Jesus isn't calling us to half measures. The whole focus of faith is supposed to be a life devoted to following him. We're called to care for the people of God, for the church, and to do things in his name for his reason. So earthly peace is not the aim, but following on in Jesus' name. Seek him alone to find his way, loving Christ and his church each and every day. In a world where the normal way is to hold on to our lives and to build our own goals, Christ calls each of us to sacrifice everything, every single thing. And to follow him. Faith in Christ calls us to put him first in every aspect of what we do. How we live. How we speak. Every single part of us is his. Whoever finds his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. This is the central reality of walking with Christ. Faith costs everything we have. 
family, friends, future. It all must be placed on the altar. Relationships, hopes, dreams, everything will be called for by Christ. Okay, are you guys feeling comfortable, warm, happy, satisfied, sanctified? Are you feeling like this has been an easy message? If you are, you're not paying attention. <laughs> I had one time when I was preaching and I, I started by preaching rank heresy, deliberately, oneness uh, theology, which was false. My, my message was about how you needed to pay attention. <laughs> and I got to the end of that part and I said, what do you think? How is this? Is this good? And one of the people who clearly hadn't been paying attention in the back said, yeah, amen, woo! Well, you made my point for me. And today I want to make sure that every single one of us is hearing this call. I'm not talking to the person next to you. Look at yourself. Listen to what God is saying to you. Jesus is saying there's only one way. And that's total surrender of your life today. He's asking you if you are holding anything back. He's asking you, are you hanging on to your life? Have you given in yet? Have you surrendered to him? Or are you still trying to do it by half measures? And I want you to think about it because I know how hard it is. I'm not just preaching here saying, oh yeah, I've got this all worked out and everything's good and now you guys got to catch up. I understand how hard it is to surrender. While we're talking today, I know the Holy Spirit will be tapping on each one of our hearts. He's going to be pointing to something that we haven't. And we have a choice. We can say, no, no, Jesus, that one's mine. We can struggle. We can feel the continuing problem of that issue because we're just too stubborn to surrender to him. Or we can say, okay, I give up. I surrender. Today is the day. So like I say, I know each and every one of us, including myself. Trust me, this was a, this was a hard one to write, to write because I had to go through some stuff myself. Each and every one of us has stuff that's going on where we need to surrender. Do you hear me? Do you get that I'm talking to you? Not the guy next to you. And that includes me. Do you know the risen Christ? Are you giving him every single aspect of your existence? If not, you will lose it. You're not going to win. You're not going to get anything. You're going to lose. Do you hear me? That thing you value most, whether it be your friends, your family, your children, if you hang on to it, it's gone. It's lost. It's dead. It's destroyed. And you did it. <laughs> Hanging on won't help. Surrender. There's no middle ground. For the one who tries to do it their way, there is only death. But to the one who overcomes, to the one who takes up their Christ or cross and walks with Christ, there is the crown of life. Amen? Let's pray. I'm going to ask you guys today to do something special. Stand with me. This is a hard one to focus on. This is one of those things that we can dodge sometimes. So I want to take time as we pray. I want you guys to listen to the Spirit. And I want you to be open to surrender. If you need prayer afterwards, if you have stuff that you're working through and you need help, come talk to me, come talk to the elders. There will be people up here to pray. Throughout the week, if God is touching your heart or your life, Come talk to me. I want to hear. I'm not too busy, okay? Let's stand together. We need to help each other in this. Support each other in this time. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are good. You love us so much. You are so faithful and trustworthy. 
Today it is hard to surrender to you, we know. It's hard to give up every bit of our life and to believe and trust that you will do better than we could do. Help us to surrender control. We can't do it apart from you. Help us to give up. Lord, if there are family members that we've been hanging on to, that we've been trying to fix, we give them to you. If there are areas of our life where we've been hanging on and denying your power, help us to surrender to you today. Make us totally devoted to you. Let us pick up our cross and follow you. Help us by your spirit to do all that we're called to do. And may we see the reward. May we see our families turn to you. May we see our loved ones know you. May we see that walking with you is the better way. And may we help others to walk that way as well. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.